Michael's going to talk about himself, so I'm not going to give it all away by uh, a long introduction, but I hope that I hope that his story will be as meaningful to you as it has been for me and those of us who have worked with him on his book. The book is a treasure. It is a, a beautiful story of his search for his mother, it, but it's in her voice. It's, she tells the story. It's very unique. I'm very proud to have published it, and I'm very proud to introduce to you Michael Marcades. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today. It was my privilege to be in this room a year ago. Were some of you here a year ago? Okay, well, I um, hope it doesn't bore you to see a couple of pictures that I shared a year ago. Uh, before I get started, I would just like to express some love and appreciation to some people. Um, my wife, Kelly, who has, Kelly, you want to just wave? Uh, the redhead over in the corner. Um, Kelly has been such a blessing to me, I, and I, she didn't even tell me to say that. She truly has been. Um, Kelly has, has held my hand and held me up on some days when the weight of my mother's story was almost too much to bear. Today I also have uh, my son with me who flew in from Alabama. Ian, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. I also have two dear friends with me, Stephen Nielsen and Carolyn Nielsen. Uh, I've known them for over 35 years. They've walked a little bit with me through this journey. Is Gary Shaw still in the room or did he leave? Gary's out in the hall. Um, I've known Gary for probably 30 years. Gary uh, opened the door of understanding about a little bit about my mother's life when I was a very young adult. And I had no clue that 30 years later I'd be standing here with you today talking about a book that I've written about my mother. Um, I hope I haven't left anybody out. Oh, I have left somebody out. I have left God out, and I don't want to overlook that. Um, God has been good to me. And I want to give him the glory uh, to, of whatever happens today. And I honestly mean that. If you're a pessimist about Christians, let me encourage you to please hear what I'm saying as truth. Um, I'm grateful to God for, the, for what I've been able to endure in my lifetime, for the truth that I've been able to face fully, and for the life that he has given me. And I'm grateful to so many people uh, whom he gave to me to not replace my mother, because my mother can never, ever be replaced, uh, but to, in her stead, to offer me love and encouragement through the years. I can't quite see what this is, but I'm going to take you through it uh, quickly, and I'm going to try to read the uh, epilogue of my book, and I will look forward to entertaining your questions when I return later on sometime tomorrow, I guess. Oh, Deborah, Is Deborah still in the room? Deborah, I, I left you off my list, and Chris Gallup. I'm grateful to Chris Gallup because Chris shared my manuscript with Deborah at a time when I guess you maybe thought you were finished publishing books. Is that right, Deborah? Kind of. And, and then her response was to Chris, well, you're right, I'm not finished. So, Deborah, I just want to express my genuine appreciation to you for believing in this story and for publishing it. I'm honored to be in your bevy of authors. Today, I have some slides. Is this it? Okay. I assume we go forward there. My, this is the cover of my book. Um, created by um, a gentleman in Nashville, Daniel Wisnott. Um, I'm just grateful to him. Daniel paid the price to learn a little bit about my mother's life before he did this for me, and uh, I'm delighted to share it with you. My goal today, gosh, I can't see, and I can't move away from this microphone, can I? Okay. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yes, that's way better. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am, and I want to expose you to the woman I know, Melba Christine Youngblood Marcades Rose Sheremy. Uh, it's my understanding that many people, when they saw her depicted in Oliver Stone's movie, thought she was made up, created. I assure you, she's not. She's real. She was someone's daughter. She was someone's sister. She was someone's husband. 
and she was my mother, and I'm delighted to tell you about her today. Um, I'm convinced that the facts that are on the board there are things about me, uh, some accomplishments. Uh, I have been very driven in my life, 12 years of college, nobody does that without being driven. Uh, I didn't think I could stop until I'd earned a PhD. I guess somewhere along the road I kept trying to prove that I was um, of value and worth something because so many people uh, didn't value my mother as anything worth preserving. Um, and my wife tells me that perhaps I've walked down those roads of accomplishment merely to feel better about who I am. Um, I am the son of Edward Joseph Marcatus. My name is not pronounced Marcades. I grew up with it being pronounced Marcades. I'm convinced my grandparents were trying to do everything they could to separate me from my father, who was uh, not portrayed as a loving man. But when I was 38 years old and I found my dad, I found that that was certainly not the case. Um, I have earned a, earned a PhD in fine arts from Texas Tech University. I've always also taught at Texas Tech University. I've taught at Columbus State University. I know some of you here are from Georgia in Columbus. I've taught in, in Alabama, and I'm presently doing the most difficult job I've ever had in my life, and that's teaching public school in Texas. Um, I am also an ordained minister. Um, I've been in, uh, in ministry for 30 years. I live in Odessa, Texas with, with my lovely wife and our three dogs. And I have been working on this project for well over 25 years, maybe 30 years. Um, my students don't like to work on anything beyond 20 minutes. And I tell them that sometimes things that are worth doing take far longer than 20 minutes. Uh, 30 years of research, 10 years of writing, and I have been through four complete revisions. And when I, went, when I met Deborah, I thought I was finished, but I wasn't. Uh, Deborah. Uh, held my feet to the fire in ensuring that everything that I put in the book, particularly in, a, in relationship to the assassination, could be proved by an existing document. Thank you, Deborah. And I've already told you that, so I'll move ahead. This is the back of the book. Um, I don't know if you've seen that picture of my mother uh, or not, but that, that looks like a woman who's looking to enjoy life and to love and to be loved. I'm delighted that Joan Mellon uh, has provided the, the quote on the back of the book. I'm so honored by, that a woman by, like Joan Mellon would read my book and pen words of encouragement about it. This is a picture, most of you, many of you seen this picture? Uh, this is the last mug shot of my mother. Very different looking woman than, than that. Um, I see a lot of things in this picture. Um, uh, what do you see? Sadness. Sadness. Uh, she looks worn out to me. Uh, she, pardon me? Broken down, exhausted. And I, I believe that is indeed the condition she was in when she died. I have a lot of sadness about that. I believe she died out in the middle of nowhere near Gladewater, Texas. I believe she died, died feeling very much alone, very much used up, of little value to anyone. I love this picture. Um, I had hoped when it said in the bottom right corner, love your wife, I had hoped that she had written this uh, and given this to my father. Nope. There was someone else. It's funny how family hides things. Has your family ever hidden anything like your mother was married once earlier? Uh, my research has proven all this, but I love this story uh, attached to this picture. Isn't she beautiful? She lied to get this job. My aunts tell me, my aunts just laugh about my mother telling the world that she could do anything and everything. She'd never operated a telephone switchboard in her life. Lied about it and immediately picked it up. You know, one of the things that I like to share with people is that my mother, what you see in the picture, the last mugshot, looks like a woman worn out of little value. My mother was very intelligent. She just made bad choices. She was beautiful, and her beauty was used in a bad way throughout her life. Um, I was given, I'll refer to this later, I was given a sack, a grocery sack full of items. When my grandmother and my grandfather had passed away, my aunt, who lived in North Dallas, handed me a grocery sack full of letters 
pictures, documents, handwritten letters by my mother, all kinds of material. Today, we, you would probably pass on a flash drive to your grandson or whatever. I had a, ba a bag, a sack full of goodies. And that sack full of goodies, I had no idea would become the foundation for my research for the next 30 years. Sweet pictures, right? Picture on the left is a picture, picture of my mother the day, she was, the day I was christened. Um, I often um, can uh, wish that I knew what it felt like to be held by her. Um, my father on the top right obviously was a Navy man. He met my mother when my mother was entertaining on Bourbon Street at the Blue Angel. I've been to the Blue Angel. It's no longer that. It's now the Hustler Club. Uh, fascinating place to visit for an ordained minister. <laughs> these are my maternal grandparents. I love these people. They've been long gone. I didn't really uh, understand or appreciate the sacrifice that they assumed when they took me into their house. They were in their 60s and I was five years old when I came to their house. I'm 63 years old and I think the last thing I would really like to do is bring a five-year-old into my house right now. But my grandparents loved deeply. They were not perfect people. My grandfather was not a perfect individual. If you read the book, you'll see that um, I've revealed some things and discovered some things about my grandfather that I'm sure my family doesn't want to know. But it's part of what made him who he is. By the time uh, I came into their house, I believe my grandfather had mellowed. I still remember the first spanking I got from my grandfather. It was memory filled. It's the only spanking I ever got from my grandmother, from my grandfather, and I believe that my grandmother said, look, Tom, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to raise this boy like we did our girls. But I love them a lot. On my left, my mother and her sister. <coughs> On the right, a picture of my mother when she was a young child. Uh, if you read the book, you'll learn that when she was a young child, she... Uh, contracted an acute case of encephalitis. Anybody in the room who understands that? I, I'm a, I have a PhD in fine arts, but I'll do my best to explain. Chris, are you in the room? Um, encephalitis, the swelling of the brain associated with measles, mumps, chicken pox, etc. Sometimes that experience can be acute, sometimes it can be low grade. What my mother experienced was high grade. For over three weeks, she was hospitalized with high fever uh, and encephalitis. And so what did that do to my mother? Well, medical experts tell me that it forever changed who she was. It, from that day forward, impacted her ability to make sound decisions. Uh, it set her up to have um, more than adverse reactions to alcohol and drugs. And everybody in the room is aware that my mother was severely addicted to heroin, uh, severely addicted to alcohol consumption. I remember my father, when I finally visited him when I was 38 years old, he did not know that my mother was dead, but I do remember seeing the tenderness in his eyes as we talked about her. He loved her, and he said, the day she cracked a beer bottle over my head, I said, I can't do this anymore. So my mother was very Jekyll and Hyde-like. One moment, ironing underwear, the next moment, cracking a beer bottle over my dad's head. My mother, it might be very surprising to you that she grew up in a very simple life on the farm. I love these pictures depicting her in that scene. This is a picture of the entire family. I love the one on the right. <clears throat> my mother is on the far right. My grandmother, the second from the left, and the other two, obviously, are my mother's sisters. They were all lovely girls, very different individuals. This is a picture of my mother during one of her incarcerations. This was in the grocery sack. All this stuff was in the grocery sack. Um, obviously sent home to her parents at Christmas time. I never forget, oh, this didn't show up last year either. I'll never forget how shocked I was when I looked at my mother's rap sheet. Multiple pages, multiple arrests, incarcerated many times in Angola prison by the time she was 18 for car theft. Unbelievable to me. 
multiple aliases, about 20 aliases listed there. Rose Sheremy was merely the, the alias she was assuming when she was killed. A second chance in New Orleans. My dad, a really loving, caring person. Um, of course, he met my mother at the Blue Angel, so I guess he was a normal man. And uh, like what he saw and took a step to meet my mother, he at one point took my mother home to the house uh, in the middle of the uh, screen there for you on Veterans Boulevard in, in New Orleans. That's where he tried to offer my mother a normal life, as did his mother and my uncle up here on the top left. I had a holding me uh, and my grandmother in New Orleans. Um, I'll never forget the first time I met my uncle Malcolm. When I met him, he didn't say, hey, Michael, how are you doing? It's a pleasure to have you here in New Orleans. He said, I have never seen anyone dance like your mother. And I went, okay, thank you. These are pictures of events that I do remember. I only saw my mother a couple of times that I remember in my lifetime. And then uh, one additional event, uh, her funeral, of course. I do remember this Easter Sunday standing with her out in Houston, Texas under a tree. I remember this event in East Texas at Sandy Lake. I don't remember exactly where Sandy Lake is, but it's over in that direction. But that was a lovely day for us. Um, and I share these pictures with you to let you know she was a real human. I mean, she had a family. She had a son. She had a husband or two. Um, and what you know about her connected with the Kennedy assassination is just a mere small port, portion of her entire life. Uh, also in the grocery sack that I was given were these newspaper clippings. Woman faces arson charge. There was a point in her life where she was um, in jail. She was withdrawing from heroin. She was in such pain that she stripped off all of her clothes and began to cut herself and set, something on, set her clothes on fire in the cell. Uh, she was chased down by seven youth on Bourbon Street. Uh, at one day she careened through Bourbon Street driving a car, hitting all kinds of stuff. I mean, it, how odd it is to read these uh, articles and realize that it's your mother. The one on the far right um, tells a story about her fleeing from a hospital. I was left alone in some situation. And she was being held in a hospital and she was doing everything she could to get free to get to me. Um, I'll skip that for the morning. Oops. I'm sorry, you can't see those. This is important. And I'm uh, really grateful to Gary Shaw for helping me acquire these documents. They don't exist anymore. Uh, when right in the middle of my research, I determined that it was important for me to go to Gladewater Hospital where she was last alive and to retrieve the medical documents that were at that hospital about her. It took me several hours. It was not an easy task. Um, <clears throat> and I think my presence in the hospital actually caused quite a stir because mother's records were not located in a file cabinet, they were located behind a desk when they were retrieved. I found that odd. Um, this document, this is the front page of an eight, uh, some multi-pages, eight and a half hours where my mother was given intense medical care at the hospital. Um, they expected her to live. Uh, there's numerous things in this account that, uh, that I've questioned and talked to medical uh, experts about, including all of you are probably aware of the phrase punctate stellate wound in reference to my mother. No, we were never told that. My family was never told anything about that. We were told that Jerry Don Moore ran over my mother in an out-of-the-way highway, farm to market road, 155, in the middle of the early morning hours. What happened was Jerry Don thought he ran over my mother. He dodged three skillfully placed suitcases in the middle of the road and pulled him to the right, and there my mother lay on the side of the road. He thought he hit her. He actually stopped instead of kept driving. Also, a car of African Americans showed up shortly thereafter. Jerry Don Moore managed to uh, get them to get out of their car and to touch a white woman. 
to help him load her in the back of his car so he could take her for medical care. First, in the front yard of a physician in the area. Second, in the hospital in Gladewater. So, and I'm so sorry that I did not get to talk to Jerry Don Moore. I would have thanked him. I assure you, my family did not thank him. My family was looking for someone as a scapegoat. And he, they were told by the police that Jerry Don Moore had run over her. No one talked to us at all about the punctate stellate wound to her head. And over the years, any medical experts in the room? Chris, can you explain punctate stellate wound? There are two ways you can get a punctate stellate wound. It is uh, from a gunshot wound to the uh, forehead with the barrel pressed up really close to the skin where the gas compresses up under and causes a starlight uh, wound. Or you can get it with a tremendous amount of force roughly the amount that Iron Man or Thor would use with a crowbar. It might be in five minutes. Thank you, sir. Death certificate. Stamp DOA. Obviously, mother was not dead when she arrived at the hospital. Eight hours of medical care. A simple funeral for my mother. I remember feeling so odd that day. At the funeral home, people hugging me, telling me that I that they were sorry for what I was feeling, and, and I remember going, I don't even know who this person is. Uh, on the far right is a diagram provided me by Gary Shaw of the location where mother was on the side of the road. My wife and I have been there. I've gone anywhere that I possibly could go to be as close to her as possible. Just copies of letters after letter in the grocery saying, revealing to me her inner thoughts, her disappointments, her loss of love, her feeling worthless, referring to herself as the bad penny turning up again. <coughs> Things that are hard for me to ignore. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a PhD and I can't even run a, a, a slideshow. Things that are hard for me to ignore. Uh, being lied to all these years about what happened to my mother, uh, it wasn't too long ago. Whoops, thank you. I love technologists. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Things that are hard for me to ignore. When I read that my mother was probably shot in the head, it's hard for me to ignore that. When I've been lied to all of these years, it's hard for me to ignore that. And so I spent all these years discovering as much as I possibly can <clears throat> about what truly happened to her. I'm told that I have a couple of minutes. Oh, in, in 2006, I did get a random email from someone in Holland. It didn't say, hello, Michael. All it said was, if you could know the truth about what happened to your mother, what would you do with the information? So I know there's people out there who know exactly what happened. Isn't she lovely? I'll look forward to reading my epilogue to you at some point later. Is that possible, Chris? Um, and I don't think I have any time for questions today, but I want to thank you for the privilege of talking with you about my work and about my mother. Thank you so much. Um, it's just a unfortunately timed um, television interview that we we just couldn't reschedule. But um, I will want it, what I wanted to say to you is I hope that you will get this book and read it and share it. And particularly if you have women in your family or friends that are females, loan them this book or tell them about it to get the book because it's not a book on the Kennedy assassination. And he didn't write the book to solve the Kennedy assassination. What he did was he wrote the book to find his mother. And when he found her, he realized that while she did have um, some mental illness, she had drug addiction, she had sex addiction, she was an alcoholic, she went to prison, uh, she gave him up. But when the crunch time came, 
she would tell the truth. And she was, we know now, she was an informant. She was trusted. She was a job she worked. Um, is in the record of the information that she gave was completely valid and they inactionable. When it got time for her, uh, as sick as she was, to say what she knew, she didn't hesitate. As soon as she was with people of authority in the hospital, the first hospital that she was in, she said, the people that I was with are going to kill President Kennedy. The first law enforcement officer that she got in the vehicle with, the ambulance to go to the next hospital, Lieutenant Fran Francis Fruget, she said, we're supposed to be, she had in her mind, she was going to somehow save Michael and get him back. She was going to drop off drugs, pick up money, and the guys driving were going to kill Kennedy, or they were going to kill Kennedy. She said it to doctors, she said it to nurses, she said it to other patients. If you look in the back of the book, and soon on the website for the book, we'll have the documentation that we've been able to gather. Um, they knew about this during the Clay Shaw investigation, uh, the Garrison investigation. They knew about this, the House Select Committee, and they buried it. And it wasn't until after that that it began to leak out and it came before Oliver Stone due to some good researching by our community. And he opened his movie with Rose Jeremy. That says a lot. This is such a valuable piece of evidence for us. I can't tell you that this solves the case. I can only tell you that she was a believable person, even though she had character flaws, deep character flaws. And Lieutenant Fruget went to his grave believing that she was in the car with people who could have caused or been a part of the assassination. And he told that under oath with the House Select Committee. We, those documents exist. What's happened is that they've been scrambled around and it wasn't until we got the book together were we able to pull from all the research communities, different people that knew about the Garrison case and knew about Fruget and knew about some of these people that even came forward as late as when the Assassination Records Review Board was in session one of the doctors came forward during that time. But you didn't hear about it, did you? But we know it, and we can prove it. So thank you so much. I'm so proud of this book. I'm proud of this book because it tells the story of a man search for his mother and the meaning of that in his life. It exposes how people were treated in the healthcare industry that had problems that we take for granted now. You just go to rehab and they fix you. Um, and his abandonment of her, from her. So thank you so much. And he's going to come back and you can ask him some questions. And then later on, we have a sources panel. And Larry Hancock and I are going to be talking and showing you some of those documents that we have. So thank you very much.
Thank you. I've been asked to read the epilogue to my book, and then we can take questions if you want. I entitled the epilogue, He Who Loves the Rose, A Son's Reflections. It is strange to see my mother's name in print or portrayed as a character in movies. The internet also makes it possible for thousands of interested, curious persons to learn more about her and the many facets of her life. She is an intriguing figure who emerged from nowhere and innocently became entangled in the events surrounding espionage and the deaths of two publicly prominent people. This would consequently lead to her early, lonely, and tragic demise. Unlike others, her story is personal to me. My interest goes far beyond the speculation and conjecture about who she might have been or what she might have done. My name is Michael Glenn Marcades, and I am the son of Melba Christine Youngblood Marcades. She is my mother. I am the result of a short marriage to Edward Joseph Marcades that ended in disaster along with almost all of her life experiences. When I look at my baby pictures with my young mother cradling me in her arms, I feel robbed. I have no memories of what it felt like to be held by those caring arms. I am told that she was present at my second birthday and I was also photographed with her on Easter Sunday in 1958 beneath a large cottonwood tree where I then lived. There are other black and white photos of her with me. I have no memory of those experiences. I have only one memory of seeing my mother alive. I was about 10 years old. Her mother and father, my grandparents, were my legal guardians. A yellow cab pulled up in front of their house in Duncanville, Texas, where we lived. My grandparents seemed surprised to see my mother in the back seat, and I expect they had no clue she was coming to see us as they went out on the porch to meet her. I later learned that they would go long stretches of time without knowing where she was or what she was doing. I vividly remember that moment as I looked out the living room window. I saw my mother lean forward to pay the cab fare. She gathered up her purse and makeup case while the driver retrieved a small suitcase from the trunk. Seconds later, she climbed legs first out of the rear seat, took the suitcase from the driver and started up the driveway with a dazzling smile on her face. She was magnificent to see, wearing high heels and hose a close-fitting dress, meticulous makeup, and a head full of blonde curls bouncing in all directions. I remember thinking that she was so pretty. Filled with a curious mixture of apprehension and gladness, I ran to my tiny bedroom at the back of the house. What would I say to her? Should I hug her? Would she hug me? In the back of my mind, I was remembering that my grandparents had told me to always be careful around my mother and never allow her to take me away from home. Then my grandmother, mama to me, called me to the living room. I couldn't move. She came to my room. Mike, come with me. Your mother is here to see you. Mama's voice and face were filled with gentleness and understanding. Now I know that she could tell that I was scared and confused. I remember that for several days there was laughter and happiness in the house as my mother joined in with domestic chores, cooking and ironing. I don't remember her sweeping me up into her arms or hugging me. She was probably aware that though she was my biological mother, we were relative strangers. She didn't know me at all, nor I her. Then with no advance warning, mother was gone just as quickly as she had arrived. Though I feel certain she told me goodbye, I don't remember it. Almost two years passed before I heard anything more about my mother. Then came September 4, 1965. Unfortunately, the occasion was not nearly as pleasant as the day she had arrived in the yellow cab. Though the details surrounding the situation were sketchy, the bottom line was totally clear. Mother was dead. It was very hard for a 12-year-old boy to process an experience like that. And the feelings live with me until this very day. I recall the funeral, hugs and condolences, struggling to walk close to her as she lay in the casket. Although I had some pictures and knew she existed, I had learned to live without her. Now she was dead. I should have known her, but I didn't. Other children knew their mothers. By the time I was old enough to retain and internalize such memories, mother had already been gone for a long time.
For decades, my deep evolving feelings about her premature passing and her mysterious death were overshadowed by my own self-involvement. My grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins supported me while reaching my life goals. High school, college, marriage, fatherhood, graduate school, ordination, church music ministry, and reaching the long-range goal of a PhD, followed by a choral conducting career at the university level. Through my years, my early years, immediate family members and others had made limited comments in the outside world. I heard whispers about my mother's years of mysterious absences, <clears throat> and hints that she was a troubled soul who chose the wrong world in life and had always been in trouble. Somewhere in my late 30s, I felt an increasing desire to seek my own legitimate answers. For a goodly portion of the next 20 plus years, I devoted large amounts of time to related research. Who was this woman who gave me life? The beautiful girl holding me in her arms. Who was my mother in reality? Initially, I found my relatives to be tight-lipped about her as their sibling, in-law, or daughter. After many years of curiosity seekers plying them for personal information about Melba Christine Youngblood Marcades, they simply wanted to let the past stay in the past. Years later, I came to understand that preference as an outward manifestation of their protracted inner pain and emotional exhaustion. Nevertheless, and probably solely for my personal benefit, my grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins provided periodic glimpses into my mother's convoluted short life. As I dug deeper into her past in a more concise manner, I began to discover information far beyond what I hoped to find and in greater detail. Much of this detailed information came to me through a large number of carefully preserved handwritten letters in my mother's hand. These letters introduced me to the private thoughts of a young woman who struggled with a myriad of desires, hardships, disappointments, and addictions. Many of these facts and issues were confirmed when I, as a 38-year-old man, located, contacted, and visited my father, Edward Joseph Marcatus, for the first time in my life. I will never forget the tenderness in his eyes as we talked about mother. Sadly, he knew nothing of her mysterious, untimely death. It was through him that I learned more about mother's private, New Orleans life, and the hard to understand specifics of their divorce, particularly his being excluded from my life. Additionally, I learned about a former unknown extended Marcatus family, including Barbara, my father's second wife for over 20 years, and three half-brothers, Terry, Dean, and Barry, all welcomed me with open arms. As the years pass, my research intensified. With every new discovery, I became convinced that mother's story had to be told, her real story without the suppression of the truth. I had to tell it for my own peace and satisfaction. To that end, I have written this book. Every penned word has drawn me closer to her. In the process, layers of discovery have emerged. At moments, I have cried out in anger against those who hurt her in her short life, and I have marveled at those who loved her through every winding turn in the treacherous road she had chosen. I know, in the eyes of many, she was a woman of questionable character who lived a bizarre life. Nevertheless, she gave me life. And in spite of her absence, or because of her absence, I have done my best to live it well. Though I was disenfranchised from her presence, a fact that caused me much confusion and pain over the years, I have morphed into moments of forgiveness, compassion, and the mature understanding love of an older son. What I would give for just one hug and glimpse of her face. Though I can't return to the past or change it in any way, it brings me some degree of peace to have shared the experience of my life with others who perhaps are looking for the same peace and acceptance within their own ambivalent lives. And then I end it with soli dei gloria, which translated from Latin means, may God receive all the glory for everything. 
So I would be delighted to entertain any questions you have if, if I'm allowed to. I don't know about it. Title, sir? I don't know about it. I am learning about other films that have been produced in Australia and other locations that I'm interested to see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll hold you to that. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Marchetti's, uh, that's a fantastic epilogue. I don't see anybody can ask you a question without about, 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 about starting to cry or something. Oh, well. I've cried a few days along the road. Yeah. Um, so, um, is your father still alive? No, sir. Um, ironically, my father died of a brain tumor six months after I found him. Oh, if I had waited six more months, it would have been too long. But it, as uh, finding my dad and my half-brothers, uh, you know, if I had grown up in that household, my life would have been very different. I'm an ordained Protestant ministry, a college professor with a PhD. Uh, they grew up, my brothers, half-brothers grew up Catholic. Uh, my family was very devout Catholics. Uh, not that the whole world has to go to college. None of my brothers went to college, but they all own their own businesses and are quite successful. I wish I had their financial income. PhD seldom affords that kind of income. Uh, but. Nevertheless, if I had grown up in that household, I would have certainly been a different individual than I am today. But it, they were so sweet. You have to understand, these are people who had, well, Barbara, my father's wife, said, you know he's going to show up at your door someday. And my dad waited his entire life for that to happen. I'll never forget getting off the plane at the airport and seeing my father standing over up against the wall in a very unassuming way just waiting for me to go over there. It was just um, a precious reunion. And my dad was very interested to show me the specifics of their divorce, that my mother had written in the stipulation that he be completely out of my life. And of course, honestly, I wish somebody in my family had told that to me, because I grew up thinking my father didn't care, and that certainly was not the case. Uh, my sort of focus is a little different. Um, in your investigation letters and everything, did you find any evidence of intelligence ties with your mother? And say at your funeral, was there any like strange characters there? Or could you talk or give us a teaser on any of that part of a part of the story? Uh, okay, I, I'm not sure I know how to tease, but I'll tell you what I know. Um, well, you got to sell your book. Yes. <laughs> Please buy. Uh, <laughs> I do uh, know for a fact that my aunt and uncle in North Dallas were contacted by someone who said he was attached with the CIA. And uh, this has been documented by Gary Shaw, um, the, Eli Schwartzen, supposedly attached to the CIA, called my aunt and uncle trying to, to, to share with them information that he said would protect them. Uh, my aunt and uncle never met with that individual. So I don't know any more than that. I do know that mysteriously, in the Gladewater Hospital where my mother died, my aunt and uncle immediately uh, hopped on the highway to head there to identify my mother's body. And when they got there, they were told that someone had already been there to identify her. Uh, they were told that a red-haired cousin had already showed up at the hospital and verified who she was. We have no idea who that is. So she had another life. Uh, she had another life, an understatement, yes. Yes, sir. Was she ever Organs were sent to Austin for analysis, but my family never saw an autopsy report at all. Never. And in spite of us trying to get answers about that, we were never, we, I was never able to get anything, any report, nothing in existence about it at all. Did you, did you ask for an autopsy? Uh, at, what I have done, Gary, I'm, sorry, I'm so glad you're here. Over the years, I have written to 
entities, organizations, trying to get as much information as I could about Mother. Uh, and the only letter, only responses that I've ever received is nothing is available. I'm just relieved that I have the medical documents from the Gladewater Hospital. Therein lies the tale of the end of her life. Those documents no longer exist. Fortunately, Gary and my lawyer helped me retrieve those documents long ago. Yes, sir. I still don't remember the title, but it was, um, the movie was, I read the review, it's basically the Rose Jeremy story. Huh. It, it, they changed the character to a man. Oh. But it was her story. Okay. Okay, we'll look that up, Chris, right? That must be exciting for you. What's that? Exciting. Um, every, every, time, every time I've watched Oliver Stone's JFK, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'd use the word exciting uh, because... Uh, have, have, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I want to read about it. I want to see it. I want to find out what it is. Uh, but I remember when I first saw the JFK, uh, the last scene of my mother lying dead on the side of the road, pretty penetrating. Yes. And they all covered up, even still, for 50-something years. Did yes, sir. Uh, just in your investigations, then the double ARB, I think, or Jason Horner, somebody, they found the bartender at the bar. Okay. Did you know this? Man, is it? Is it a, yeah, I'm trying to so, remember his name. And Manuel? they verified that she was there with two Cuban-looking guys. So you, you know about that, right? Yes, she, okay. yes, that's been verified in several different ways. By the way, I want to let you know that I said this earlier today, but I am extremely proud to have had this, doc, this book published by Deborah Conway uh, because Deborah Conway insisted that everything that is written be documented. And so I stand by the words in this book very strongly, and I'm grateful to her. Anyone else? I don't want to take your time. Yes, Larry. Uh-oh. I just wanted to let you all know that we will be coming back to this more from a JFK conspiracy source standpoint tomorrow evening. Both Deborah and I will be talking about Rose Sheremy as a witness, as a source, evaluating that and talking about some of those questions that you might ask. Michael has written a book about his mother. He is not a JFK researcher. Gary, there are those of us that are, have been with this more from that standpoint. So we don't want to ignore it now or not answer the questions, but we will come back to it and to Rose tomorrow night as part of the sources panel that Deborah and Stu and I will be speaking to tomorrow night. And Michael will be sitting in with us too. So we're not just abandoning it at this point in time. My, the reason for me doing this book is so that the world could have a chance to hear the entire story, not just what has been available on the internet and around the world for that limited space of time. Don't you wonder how it is that she got to that point in her life? Uh, many questions that I've tried to answer from her physical health, her mental health, her home life, how it was experienced, how she experienced growing up in the Youngblood household, how different it was from my experience with those same people. Because when I got to my grandparents, they were very different than the parents who raised her. What was her experiences with her siblings? How did she feel? All of those things. My, my effort is to tell her entire story, which honestly I, I think is very interesting. And I have addressed the uh, Kennedy assassination as well. Chapter 7, rewritten this, this summer, this past July, with 10 to 12 hour days. So thank you, Deborah. Yes. Yes. I, I don't mean to take your time needlessly. Does anyone else have a question? Yes, ma'am. I believe this is the movie that the gentleman is referring to is called Blind Horizon. Blind Horizon? Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I'll have to check it out. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I uh, had the opportunity to meet Sally Kirkland a few years ago. Yes, sir. And what she told me was that it was important for her to portray your mother more as a real person and not just this part of the event. Yes. 
And, and so that's exactly what I'm trying to do in this book. You know, I could stand here and talk to you only about chapter 7, but that does not tell Mother's story about how she came to be in this seedy world, this existence, and how encephalitis impacted her ability to make decisions in life, and how her responses to alcohol and drugs were exacerbated by that medical anomaly in her life. So I, I did it for me, but I'm hoping you're interested in the entire story. Yes, sir. John. Out. Uh, something I discovered in Jack Kennedy, who went to see the uh, psychoanalyst Eric Erickson, brought her two children along mm -hmm. and said, I worry that they may have suffered from this assassination. Huh. And Erickson turned her down in terms of how he was as a child stuff for us. And the thing that really um, moved me about herself. If you read her uh, testimony to the Warren Commission, she gets so far into her story, and whoever was interviewing her said, and then what happened, and she said, I cannot remember. And it was the moment after Kennedy was struck with the death of the Yes. And I think some of these things, you and others say, bring out the very personal aspects of this assassination, mm. many of which could remain unknown and unremembered yes. by those of us who are researching. It's a tremendous contribution. Thank you, John. I appreciate those words. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. I don't know if you're interested or not, but I thought I might relay this to you. Uh, my own children have not come to this easily. In fact, for the entire time when I've been researching and writing, is Kelly in the room? Am I telling the truth? It's, it's like my children didn't want to know. I would never, never could understand that. My children. Now, Kelly's children had no choice because I was writing in their presence and talked with them constantly about it and had my teenage daughter read it to see if she wanted to be interested at all. Frequently, I had her read things that I'd written. I'd say, Does, is this grabbing your attention or not? But my own biological children, to this day, until now, have not wanted to know these facts. Now, I don't know what that is, John. 36, uh, 34, um, 25. I hope I'm still here to answer their questions. <laughs> Good thing they have a book, right? Yes. 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 I'm honored by your time and attention. If, if no one has a question, I'll leave you to other thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.